So good. Aren't they amazing? Give them another hand. Just praise God for our team. What a team. Thank you, Pastor Leanne. Uh, you know, uh, tomorrow is uh, Drayton's memorial, and we are, you know, it's so sad in ministry this size, we're not always able to do a memorial here, and we, we, we actually are trying to do fewer, and I'll tell you some of the reasons why. We've done memorials over the years for some of the most tragic situations. You know, what ends up happening when you do a memorial in your auditorium is that people will never walk back in because it's a reminder of losing their loved one, and you want it to be the place of recovery. But in this situation, for Drayton, we're going to remember all that he did to impact in this ministry and, and all the differences he made and going to be here for his family. So uh, we'll be having that memorial tomorrow. You can pray for the family. Some of them are here, and we're so grateful they're here today. Pray for Dalton. Uh, just a precious young boy with an incredible maturity at his age. And just pray through this. And for Jen um, and just uh, Dalton's mom. And uh, for mom and dad and sister who just got into town, pray for them all. You know, I hope you had a wonderful weekend because it was beautiful so far, right? I mean, my goodness, 80 degrees, and uh, I finally got a day to, to take about four or five hours to myself, went out and golfed with my son, son-in-laws, my, my good friend, uh, Corey uh, Davidson, firefighter, and a great golfer. He's running my, my slides for my sermon here. And uh, so I was really hesitant to say that I beat him uh, this week because he beats me every time. But uh, I keep waiting for the screens to go dark. So, Corey, don't do that. All right, my sermon's right there. But, uh, you know, just getting out, enjoying the weather, enjoying the creation that God has given us. And listen, enjoying the relationships. And some of us go, it doesn't matter how good the weather is. I got a relationship and it's driving me crazy. It's driving me to the edge. It's not healthy. What do we do about that? As I think about this series, I've had many, many emails, many responses, many communication that a lot of you are saying, listen, this is helping me, this is encouraging me, and that's because it's the Word of God, not me. But today I want to look at a message that I consider of the nine messages I've written in this series, and we have a ways to go, is the most important for you personally for your relationships. It is about relational boundaries. It's about setting guardrails in place because that's what the Bible's about. A lot of people think, yeah, the Bible's written in it. Gives all these commands to make my life miserable and boring. It's exactly the opposite. It's to make your life fulfilling and rich. When we do it God's way, it's extraordinary. I've often said I put my life up against anybody. I mean, I dare you to say you've had a more exciting, more adventurous, more fulfilled life. And maybe you have. But, but God has not stopped me from enjoying life. He's made life. And I want you to experience that in your relationships. You know, some of you right now may be saying, man, I've had a crazy making relationship at one time or another. And uh, let me ask, how many of you have had a crazy making relationship or a difficult relationship at a time, one time or another? Okay. With a crazy maker. Okay. Um, you who didn't raise your hand, you're the crazy maker. So... <laughs> Should always raise your hand. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We all can be the crazy maker at one time or another, okay? We're all imperfect. And I want you to hear some practical application because relationships are the most important bedrock of our lives. Relationships are how we live. Relationships we have at work, at school. Relationships with our spouse, with our boyfriend, our girlfriend. Uh, relationships and dating and courting relationships and there's all kinds of relationships, and I want you to see from the Word of God and what He teaches us, what the Holy Spirit teaches us about these amazing principles. And let me, let me kind of let me use it this way to illustrate. You know, it's amazing. Unfortunately, all those preachers, prophets of doom, were wrong. The solar eclipse happened, and we're still here. Otherwise, we were lost, and the rapture happened. We didn't even hear the trumpet. But I'm jesting, okay? The reality is stop doing that, preachers. Jesus is not going to rapture his church till he's ready, and that's in his perfect time. But I did get a chance to go out with my wife on a Monday. We hadn't had many uh, days together in the last two years with school and all that's been going on. So we laid down on the ground. It was a beautiful day, and we watched the 68% eclipse that we had here. And then I kept running in the house and seeing like different places in Texas where it was pitch dark. It was so cool, so cool. 
And I thought about this. You know, when the, when the moon, because of the distance the sun is, 98 million miles away, whatever it is, uh, the moon eclipses the sun. So we see that darkness that's caused by that eclipse. But you know what happens in our lives when Jesus eclipses our lives? Light shines in every area. And, and listen, the world is upside down in turmoil. And last night I'm talking and drones are attacking from Iran, attacking Israel. We need to pray for Israel. And we need to pray for the, the innocent on both sides. We need to pray for America because now we're in the conflict, which could be a world war. You never know. Amen. And the truth is we need to pray. We need to be strong in our faith. And we need to understand this is the consequence of unhealthy relationship. Amen. Not just geopolitical, personal. And we all have those relationships so what does the Bible say about that? Well, in every crazy-making relationship you're in, you're in a relationship with somebody, listen close, listen close, I know there's a lot going on, who expects you to be God in some way in their life. Amen. Let me explain it. They expect you to take responsibility because they won't. So you got to be God in their life. They expect you to be God of their money because they won't do anything to fix their financial errors. They expect you to be God of their personality. Well, I've got a strange personality. I just don't like people. So you fix it. Be God of my failures. Be God of my problems. You know, they expect you to be God at work because they have a low work ethic. So you work twice as hard so I can keep my job. Amen. It's called the socialism approach, right? Be God of my emotional issues. They say things like, I don't really care that you have your own struggles. I want you to deal with mine. We get that a lot in church, a lot. And the problem is these people will make you crazy. Amen. When you're around them, they'll make you crazy. And God never intended for you or I to be God of someone else's life. They need to take responsibility. And right now, who's asking you to be the God in their situation? You're like, oh, it's my 30-year-old son. He's still home. It's my spouse. It's the person I'm dating. It's the classmate. Who is it? And the reality is this. When somebody is asking you to make their life better, their unhappiness makes you miserable. It's demanding you to take care of them. Now, I'm going to read a passage. It's the only time we're going to look at it, but I'm going to unpack these principles with a lot of other passages in Scripture, and I want you to stay on course with me today. I mean, pull the, the message notes out, follow along. This is critical, all right? Some of you, when I said crazy making relationships, you're like, boom, somebody's name popped in your mind, somebody's face popped in your mind, some of you are shaking your head, some of you are like this because they're sitting next to you, whatever it is, all right? But listen, here it is, Proverbs chapter four. My son, if you will take time to stop and listen to me and embrace what I say, you will live a long and happy life full of understanding in every way. Who doesn't want that? Do you know that God wants you to have that? I have taken you by the hand in wisdom's ways, pointing you to the path of integrity. Your progress will have no limits when you come along with me and you will never stumble as you walk along the way. So receive my correction, no matter how hard it is to swallow. For wisdom will snap you back into place. Her words will be invigorating life to you. Do not detour into darkness or even set foot on the path. Stay away from it. Don't even go there. For troublemakers are restless if they're not involved in evil. They are not satisfied until they have brought someone harm. They feed on darkness and drink until they're drunk on the wine of wickedness. But the lovers of God walk on the highway of light, and their way shines brighter and brighter until the perfect day. But the wicked walk in thick darkness, like those who travel in fog, and yet don't have a clue why they keep stumbling. Now, don't be tempted to think of just evil people, serial killers. We're talking about people who are the crazy makers. Listen carefully, my dear child, to everything that I teach you and pay attention to all that I have to say. Fill your thoughts with my words until they penetrate deep into your spirit. Then, as you unwrap my words, they will impart true life and radiant health into the very core of your being. And here's a critical one. So above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellspring of life. Avoid dishonest speech and pretentious words. Be free from using perverse words no matter what. So God says... 
Protect your heart. It is the wellspring of life. Amen. How do you do that, though? How do you do that when you've got crazy makers in your life? Well, when you see a section in the Bible that says, above all, and the word of God is already above all, that means it's above all squared. It's really important. So guard your heart. What's your heart? In the Hebrew, which is the language of the Old Testament, your heart is the inner person, the inner man, the inner woman, the inner person, child, teenager. And, And It's everything that's important. Your core values in your heart, your feelings, your emotions that are in your heart, your thoughts, your decisions, they're all in your heart. Your life is in your heart, so guard it above all. I think the best way to start off this morning, or this afternoon now, is to give you the vision for the way God designed relationships. And I wanna give you the good news first, okay? Because God designed two foundational elements, I called them bedrocks, that if these are not in place, you can't have healthy relationships. And here's what they are. They're simply two words. Look look at the first. Two foundational elements God designed for healthy relationships. One, grace. Grace. Grace is the foundational bedrock for a healthy relationship. But it's not grace alone. We'll talk about that in a moment. What is grace? Well, grace is my favorite word in the Bible. That's why I named the church after it. Because God's grace is what saves us. For by grace, you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast or brag. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do great works. Now, all of that to say this, God gives us grace the moment we understand we're a sinner, we're incapable of saving ourselves, we're incapable of participating in our salvation. Some of you are like, wait, I I went to church, I, I prayed the rosary every day, I went to confession did nothing for you. You can't participate in your salvation. It is a gift of grace. And once you admit you're sinful and can do nothing, you look to the cross and say, Jesus did it all. I trust in him. And he comes into our lives and he makes everything new. That is grace. Then he says, I want you to be the delivery system of my grace. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. Every believer has received grace gifts, so use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many-colored tapestry of God's grace. I love that. It's a multicolored tapestry. That's God's grace. And we've been talking a lot about this grace. And we're going to continue to talk about grace because grace is basically this. Everybody catch this. It is God saying, I'm for you. God is for you. He's on your side. So I don't believe in God. Well, he believes in you. He's on your team. If you come to know Jesus as your savior, he is all in for you. Grace means that there's nothing I can do to make God happy. There's nothing I can do to make God love me more than he already does. He doesn't love me if I perform better. Some of you are you're like, what? Because you grew up with parents you could not please. You grew up with older siblings you couldn't please. You grew up around coaches or teachers, never good enough. And so that's how you see God. Well, I have news for you. He's on your team. He's cheering for you. He died for you. He believes in you. And he says this to you. I have given you all the grace you need. It's all there. And so all we do is we accept it. Now, there's no way I can perform at a top level every day. Neither can you. Yet he loves me just the same. When I screw up royally... He loves me just the same. That's grace. Grace comes in two forms. First, it comes in the vertical relationship. The vertical relationship is me and God. And that comes by understanding his word, understanding the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us the moment we trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross. That is the vertical. Here's the horizontal. The horizontal relationship is we take grace from each other and we give grace to each other. That's what Peter was talking about in those verses, or in that verse. We are supposed to be the actual delivery system of God. We're supposed to be the Amazon of God's grace. Amazon's at my house all the time. Most of the time, delivering the 500 vitamins my wife gives me every day to keep me alive. But they're there at all times of the day. I get up at three, they're there. I go to bed at midnight, they're there. And the reality is this. God says, I want you, Christian, to be the delivery system of my grace. When you let somebody listen to you, 
and you tell them your story and they don't judge you and they don't condemn you and you don't judge them and you don't condemn them, that is grace. It's fuel for life. It's relationship. You know why? Because when that happens, you're safe in that relationship. You're in a relationship without condemnation. No judgment and never do you have to worry about being condemned. You know how you can tell an immature Christian? They're condemning, backstabbing, backbiters, gossips, and slanders. And there's no grace with them. As a matter of fact, they feel justified to have no grace. Those are crazy makers. And you know who they usually are? Deeply religious people. Even Christians who think Christianity is performance-based. Let me tell you something that will blow your mind theologically. God lives outside the realm of time and space. We live under the realm of time and space. Everything that has happened, did happen, is happening, and will happen right now in God. And in all of that, he knows everything you're going to do before you do it, and he loves you just the same. That's grace. Now, here's the second foundational element, truth. When Jesus came into the world, he said, I am full of grace and truth. John 1, 14 says that. Now, truth, as a matter of fact, is put this way in the Bible when it comes to us living out the truth of God. In Ephesians 4.15, instead, we will speak the truth, how? In love. And when we do that, we're growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. That's grace and truth. That's the combination. So what is truth? Well, truth is what it is. Truth is what's real. You know, there's truth right now. It's called gravity. If I step off this, I'm plunging to the ground. And I'm probably not getting up because I threw my back out yesterday. So if I hit the ground, call the ambulance, right? I can't stand off the ground because of gravity. That's a law of physics. Well, there is a law of truth. It's God's word. It is 100% accurate. It is without error. Now, when you have a truthful person in your relationship, they give you honest feedback. But when you have a grace and truth person, they give you honest feedback with love. There's the feedback we give each other in business and the feedback we give each other in relationship and the feedback we give each other in marriage. And if Christians could learn, it should be grace and truth always. Let me give you this. Grace provides the safety. Grace provides the safety. Grace says, I love you no matter what. I've died for you. I've given you everlasting life. I live inside you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's the safety. And truth provides the structure. The structure is what sanctifies us. In every healthy relationship, you have to have both. If you just have grace, you're going to run off into addiction and self-harm. As a matter of fact, if you want to see what all grace, no truth looks like, look at most parenting today. Amen. Let the kids raise themselves. You know what blows my mind? In a world where our educational system is plummeting into the depths that are beyond what I think any parent should tolerate, we have parents saying to their kids, well, where do you want to go, Johnny? What do you want to do, Johnny? Sorry, Johnny. I'm not talking about you. Johnny <laughs> wants to do what he wants to do. I'll never forget my, my oldest son, Jordan, in a Christian school all the way to eighth grade. He's like, Dad, I want to go to a public school. I'm like, really? Yeah, you know, I want to get a Division I scholarship. I want to do this. I'm like, oh, that's great. You're not. <laughs> Why? You're not. We're, we, we paid. We sacrificed. You're staying in a Christian school. Thankfully, he did. And the reality is this. Children don't raise themselves. That's why God gave them parents. You're not their friend. You're their parent. And, and, and they're, they're going to keep running off the edge of grace to the point of death if you don't have truth. You know, in parenting among Christians, uh, if we fall off on either side, it's bad. Listen, if you fall off on all grace, you're a liberal. I'm not talking about your politics. Okay. You're just like, do whatever you want. And if you fall off on the side of truth only, you're a legalist. And guess what? The result of both is tragedy Amen. and usually looks the same way. 
So, believe it or not, grace and truth, those are the good news. That's the foundation. So we got to get reality going here this morning a little bit. You know what? People that drive you crazy, uh, they need a balance of grace and truth because unfortunately, that balance is critical for healthy relationships. When things go wrong and you're going to really you know, talk about the issues, if you don't have grace and truth and that person isn't willing to receive it, it's going to be crazy making. Matter of fact, give me, let me give you this. Two reasons your relationships are out of balance. According to scripture, according to the passages I've read and the passage in Proverbs 4, the first is because someone in my life is out of control. Someone in my life is out of control. Now, if it's you, then you have to own that. You have to admit it. Because that's where healing begins. I'll talk about this in weeks ahead. But when I said, did somebody's face pop up in your mind? Did someone's name come straight to the forefront of your mind? You know, the Bible actually addresses these issues. Look at Romans 13, 13. Because we belong to the day. That's another way of saying to the light. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in the sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Does that sound vaguely familiar to the culture we live in? Like dead on. And God has called us to live decent lives unlike those who are just out of control. Hey, listen, you might think a crazy maker is hilarious in college. Oh, look, man, he's blasted out of his mind. Look, man, she's about to pass out. Wait till you marry him. It's not so funny anymore. Amen. It's destructive. And yet, guess what happens most of the time? We build those relationships in our youth and immaturity, and then we feel this, this loyalty. Well, that's my crew, man. That's my boy. That's my girl. We got to be there. We got to be there for each other. You know what happens? I wrote it this way. Those types of mutual activities lead to loyalty, which leads to catastrophe with the wrong people. Amen. Always. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Bad company corrupts good moral character. Now, you might be tempted to think, Pastor Rich is saying, man, turn on everybody that doesn't. I'm not saying turn on anybody. I'm saying be wise, set boundaries. If you don't, you're headed for destruction. Amen. When you have someone in your life that's just out of control, where their behavior is just off the scale stupid, they're impulsive, they act out, they're destructive, they don't think about consequences, most of them are males. Doesn't mean women don't have their issues, believe me. But, but that type of attitude often comes from a male. You know, I just read about that 21-year-old 20, kid trying to jump over Highway 40 on Berthoud Pass on his skis, and he died. You know, all his friends could say is, yeah, he always wanted to do things nobody could do. Yeah, like die at 21. Tragic. Leaving a family. I'm leaving friends behind. You know what? That is a microcosm of what happens when our life's out of control. You know, I'm thankful my parents were surrendered to Christ. When they became believers, everything changed. My dad was drinking before he got saved, but my mom and dad, radical change. But my two aunts, not so much. And my mom's sisters, man, they loved them, loved being with them, but, but it took them a long time to come around to the fact that that's destruction. Amen. I watched my aunt, Marcia, and she's doing great today. She's been through some tough times in her life. She was able to come out of that. Watch my Aunt Debbie. It took her a lot longer. And I'll never forget when she finally woke up. She had been in prison for being involved in meth. And I reached out to her and I sent her my book and I sent her The Purpose Driven Life. My mom had stayed in touch always and communicated. And I was able to speak into her life. Man, she... She saw God change her life, and it was a beautiful thing. We got to have a great fellowship the last few years. But then her daughter, Jenny, the only female cousin in my life, was like a sister to me. I mean, they lived with us most of our lives. Came out here, got entangled with a guy, and bad things happened and led to her suicide. Amen. And after she died, then my aunt dropped deep into a depression. And not even a year and a half or so later, my son calls me. He's a paramedic firefighter, Adams County. He said, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm an Aunt Debs, and I just had to pronounce her dead. Now, listen, always this type of craziness leads to tragedy. And if you're involved in people's lives like that, it's going to lead you down the same path. 
An addict who is imprisoned by something like alcohol, drugs, pornography, substance abuse, gambling, have some of this behavior. And everything in life for them centers around what? The next high, the next win. It should be centered around surrendering to Jesus. They're not even thinking about that. That's why you'll hear me every week talk about coming to our recovery on on Wednesday night, being a part of Celebrate Recovery. Why? Because that's where honest people come. And only one out of three people at Celebrate Recovery have an addiction. Most have hurts and hangups, and they're trying to deal with codependency and so much other. And what are they finding? They're not finding a coping mechanism. They're finding victory through Jesus Christ. And you get to find that victory in your forever family. And so I want to encourage you, be a part of that, especially if you're like, man, I have a crazy maker in my life and I don't know what to do. Guys, codependency is one of the major problems among Christians. Because we allow those who are, well, you know what? I'm called to love them no matter what. Is that what it means? No. Loving them and giving them permission And license to destroy your life is not what love means. I've often said this. My definition of codependency is a codependent person is somebody when they're falling off a cliff, somebody else's life flashes before their eyes. They're so caught up in somebody else's issue. Here's the second reason my relationships are out of control. Because someone is trying to control someone else. Someone in the relationship is trying to control someone else. When you think about that, your relationship with someone who is controlling you or trying to control you or attempting to control you is wrong. No one should be controlling you. The only person that should control you is the Holy Spirit of God. You were set free. The moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're free. Did you know that before that, you're not free? You're not even free to make good choices. You're like, wait, I know atheists, they make great choices. No, they don't, because none of those choices are for God's glory. None of those choices are sanctified. Look at Galatians 5.1. At last, we have freedom, for Christ has set us free. We must have always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Apart from salvation, one of the greatest realities that Jesus died for is to give you choices. You thought that you could always make choices, but you couldn't. You can only choose sin before you know Jesus. Some of you are like, wait, I'm not a believer, man. You're really insulting me. No, I'm not. I'm telling you exactly where I was too and every other person. But Jesus sets you free. And you should be able to say this, guys. You should have a voice. You should have the freedom to choose what job you work, not somebody else. The freedom to take what vacation you want to take, not somebody else. You should have the freedom to worship where God has called you to worship, not somebody else making that choice. You should have the freedom to speak. You should have the freedom to dream. And what happens is controlling people don't want you to have any of that. And this is the context of God's design. I'm not talking about love whoever I want to love in the bizarre, strange way. I'm talking within God's guardrails, you should be free. You should be free to look at an abuser or a controller or an addict and say, listen to me, I'm not going to be loved the way you're trying to love me because it hurts. We all need to be able to be free to say that. You know why? Because Jesus died so you don't have to suffer that pain. In a few weeks, I'm going to talk about what do you do when you're in an abusive relationship? The Bible is very clear about it. But it's not as easy as just saying, we'll get out. We have to talk about how. Remember we talked about those crazy makers, and this would be uh, the four types of people. I call them the, the bomb, the buttoned up, the baby, and the bully. Well, all of those are reflective of people that are trying to control, and all of us have some of these issues. You know, the bully controls through anger, gets mad, throws temper tantrums, they, they break stuff. They're very difficult, and they're able to control every situation by intimidation. The buttoned up They control through guilt. Guilt doesn't say, if you don't do it my way, I'll get angry. Guilt says, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to hurt and I'm upset. And you've, you've destroyed me and you better do it my way. It's just another control mechanism. And and it's same with the bomb and, and the, the baby. Okay. So this is where boundaries come in. Relational boundaries are critical. 
This is what the Bible talks about time and time again. Matter of fact, look at Titus 3, verses 9 through 11. But avoid useless controversies, genealogies, pointless quarrels, and arguments over the law. Let me pause there. Why is he saying this? Because when the believers in Jerusalem, in Asia, in Europe, in parts of Africa came to know Jesus, there were religious Judaizers. They had come to know Jesus, but they brought the law, they brought the legalism, and he's saying, no, that is not what makes you special. Your Jewish roots, your Gentile roots, that's not what makes you special. He said, they'll get you nowhere. After at first, after a first and second warning, have nothing to do with a divisive person who refuses to be corrected. For you know that such a one is entwined with his sin and stands self-condemned. And it's interesting, he's talking about legalistic people more than anything. So often, we want to limit the wisdom of the Bible to the specific context of the passage we're reading. But the Bible, though it has a contextual truth and an exegetical truth, is like a massive prism. You know those prisms, you turn it and it refracts light? Well, that's what the Word of God does, and it shines light in so many other areas. It's the living, breathing Word of God. You say, well, okay, I'm supposed to get away from that crazy maker. What if I'm married to them? Well, you're right. Divorce is not the answer. You don't run to the divorce attorney, but you make it very clear there are limitations in this relationship until you get help. Amen. You know, last week somebody uh, came up to my pastor on call, uh, Pastor Vicky, and was like, wait a second, he sounded like he was encouraging divorce. Well, first of all, I would never do that unless a person was at risk, in danger, being abused or cheated on. There are biblical concessions. However, if people choose, they take that path because they've either had someone ask for a divorce and they don't want to work on it or for another reason, God's grace is sufficient for their future. Amen. It is not just all truth. It's truth and grace. Understand that. Don't point a finger at people because everybody has a unique situation. And that doesn't mean that God's word is relative. It is truth and grace. So let me show you controlling people because many of us are in situations at home, at work, at school with controlling people. We need to identify them. First of all, legalistic, argumentative people that think they're always right are controllers. Amen. They're controllers. And I'm going to tell you right now, most of them are deeply religious. They will point fingers and believe me, they will find the faults in your life. Of course, only the faults they have in order. They'll never point out faults in your life. They have. Second are volatile people with rapid mood swings. Volatile people with rapid mood swings. I mean, from one moment to the next. They're nice. They're screaming. They're crying. They're upset. Then there's the belittling and cruel, often following compliments with criticism. You know, that yeah, dress looks all right, but kind of makes your hips look big. You know, son, it was good that you got an A-, minus, but couldn't you get an A+. Plus? You know, it's great that you did well on your ACT, but you're not going to get in a Division I school. And it's over and over and over again. Some of you are like, isn't that good parenting? No. You can have a balance of grace and truth. They're talkative more than they listen. You want to know if you can identify a controlling person or if you're one? Measure how much you talk compared to how much you listen. How many words do I speak compared to how many do I listen to? Then, emotionally unstable. If they're emotionally unstable, a lot of times they use that to control you. Amen. And they'll use their emotions to control you. And then apathetic and indifferent. Let me tell you what's scary about apathetic and indifferent people who are controllers. I've had people walk into my office over the years <clears throat> to get counseling. We, we do a lot of that in this ministry. A lot of pastors do that. And over the years, I knew when somebody walked in and they're like, I hate him. I hate her. I'm like, all right, we got something to work with. I'm serious. You know what? There's hope because there's emotion. There's feeling. When somebody came in, sat down and said, <clears throat> could care less if he was dead. I'm done. I've made the move in my mind. Could care less what she thinks. I'm already on to somebody else. There wasn't any hope. Indifference and apathy are way worse than hate. Now, the second or the first aspect, I'm going to give you two aspects of settling uh, or setting, excuse me, godly boundaries. Aspect number one is this. Love others without trying to rescue them. 
If you miss everything today, and I hope you don't, do not miss this. It's so important. I uh, was sitting uh, at a conference with Dr. Henry Cloud. Dr. Henry Cloud uh, is not just a doctor of psychology, not just a brilliant man. He's written over 20 books, uh, 20 million copies or more sold. Uh, I had just finished reading his book, Boundaries, and right before that, Necessary Endings. And when I got to this conference, it, was, it really wasn't a conference. It was Compassion International brought 19 pastors from around the country whose churches had sponsored the most Compassion International children. And you guys are among the top 20 in the nation. And so I got to, you know, be rewarded, sorry. Uh, and so we had a little golf time, and then every afternoon and night we would listen to Dr. Cloud. But we're literally sitting in a circle. And I'm like sitting in this chair, in walks Henry Cloud, Dr. Cloud, and he sits right next to me. I was Twitter-pated. It's like, oh my gosh. You know, a couple times our knees touched. It was like junior high, I'm like, oh my gosh. Anyways, and so we're talking, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, listen, at that point, after 36 years in ministry, I'm just, I'm just curious. I, I feel like I'm doing a good job at, at helping people, but I, f I need to know really where that line is between rescuing and, um, and, and helping. And he went straight to scripture, which is his MO. Man, he has the Bible memorized. And anytime you have a counselor like that, psychologist like that, you got a, you got a good person. And he took me to Galatians 6, verses I've had memorized and taught on hundreds of times, maybe more. And Galatians 6 says this, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Now, I want you to underline this, or one word. Carry each other's burdens, circle burdens, or underline it. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For each one should carry their own circle load. I'm going to define these two words for you because they are critical to your understanding and mine. I came back when he read those verses. I thought, okay, I'm going to study those words. So I did. Loving others without rescuing them is only understood by knowing those words. As a matter of fact, rescuing and enabling is codependency. And uh, people often think that's love. It's not. Because love says, I'm on your team. I'm on your side. But I'm not going to fix your problems. Let me explain this. I know as Christians, you're thinking, well, wait, pastor, we're supposed to go the extra mile. We're supposed to take the shirt off our back. We're supposed to do whatever it takes. We're supposed to turn the other cheek, which by the way, doesn't even mean that. So what's it mean? Well, it's kind of hard to understand unless you unpack this in the Greek. Let me talk first about the word burdens. In the Greek, the word burdens is defined like this. It's defined as a Huge boulder I can't carry on my own. So if somebody comes to us or comes to me and says, I have a back-crushing boulder that I can't carry. In other words, I got a medical diagnosis and it's bad. That's a, that's a boulder they can't carry. My child got a terminal diagnosis. That's a boulder they can't carry. My spouse walked out and left me for someone else. I had no idea. That's a boulder they can't carry. So we are to carry each other's boulders, right? But why does it say carry your own load? Because the word load in the Greek means backpack. It really means knapsack, but I didn't think anybody older than, or younger than me would know what that means. So think of those little backpacks, right? Kids carry them today. I don't know what the value of them are, but anyways, they carry them. Think of those little backpacks. A backpack has all your daily rations, right? And everything we mentioned up front, everything I said up front, your feelings, your thoughts, uh, your values, whatever you cherish, that's in your backpack. And life goes well, listen close, when we help each other with our bolder burdens, but when we each carry our backpack. Here's where life gets out of balance when you try to carry people's backpacks. Life goes poorly. Now, God never intended you to fix someone's emotion. 
Never intended you to fix their financial problem. Never intended you to fix their bad attitude. These would be backpack issues, and they will exhaust you. They will tap you out. I'll tell you a story real quick. In 1994, the only full-time pastor in this church was me. We had a guy that was preaching about 65% of the time, but he was working somewhere else. So I was handling everything. And I was counseling, and I thought, well, you know what? Part of my job, I want to raise up men in leadership. The problem was this. I was meeting with 20 men a month, same guys, for almost two years, taking them through the disciplines of a godly man. And all of a sudden, they started bringing their backpacks. And I started picking up their backpacks. And my wife said, stop picking up their backpacks. You're crushing yourself. You're crushing us. Do you know what happened when I stopped carrying their backpacks and taught them the principles to do it? Every one of them left the church. They're somewhere else with the pastor carrying their backpacks. That's not what we were intended to do. That's why I teach the way I teach. You got to take responsibility for your backpack. That's why our care team, our grow and serve team, our reach team are there to help you so you have the principles to carry your own backpack. Let me ask you, how many of you have ever tried to make a miserable person in your life happy? Amen. How'd that go? You're like, it made me miserable. That's right. Because you can't make them happy. They have to own their misery and give it to the Lord and work on it. Here's a question you ask to know whether you're loving somebody or trying to rescue somebody. And it's a very simple question. You just ask this. Is this a backpack they should be carrying themselves? Should they be getting a job for themselves? Should they be getting clean and sober for themselves? Should they be getting rid of their bad attitude? Should they be getting uh, work on their personality, solving their own financial problems? Should they be doing this themselves? Ask that question because I will guarantee you that will help you stop rescuing people. Hallelujah. Only Jesus can. Second aspect of setting godly boundaries, learn to confront in love. Confrontation in love is the only way that you're ever going to be able to to confront that person, that crazy maker. And listen, some of them cannot be confronted. You gotta learn to tell the truth in love. Jesus spoke about this often. He said the very thing that I'm telling you right here. Learn to tell the truth in love. In Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you privately. If they listen to you, you've won them over. That's the only thing you should want to win is the relationship, not the argument. Amen. Guys, we need to tell each other the truth. You have blind spots. I have blind spots. And sometimes we need to say, I think you missed a spot. Can we talk about it? You may not be aware of your manipulation tactics. You may not be aware of the tone of your voice. You may not be aware of your behavior. You may not be aware of how you're affecting the people around you. That's how we're supposed to approach them in love. And I know some of you are like, I tried that. It went terribly wrong. Well, you got to make sure that the aspects of humility are involved. I'll tell you, in this society today with language, you don't know if people are mad or having a good time. Look at Ephesians 4.29. And never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you in Jesus Christ until you experience your full salvation. When is that? When we get to heaven. So never grieve the Spirit of God or take for granted his holy influence in your life. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults, but instead be kind and affectionate toward one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. So now we have come to the place where the four relational boundaries can be set. If everything else is understood, we can set them. Let me give them to you very quickly. The first is this. Relational boundaries are developed by learning this skill. Always start from a position of humility clothed in love. What is humility? Humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's putting yourself in a position of subservience to the Lord and understanding you have issues too, okay? You have to intentionally do something every day. Every day, you intentionally put on your clothes. 
and thank you for doing that. We put on our clothes, we look in the mirror, we say, okay, I'm presentable, and we go out. In the same way, put on your humility, humility clothing and do it with love. John 13, 34, Jesus said, this is what sets us apart. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Does that bother anybody? New commandment? Love each other just as I have loved you, you should love each other. What does that word new mean? Well, it doesn't mean that all the old commandments were not loving or that people weren't commanded to love. The, the Ten Commandments are about loving God, the first four, loving God, the last six, loving other people. But here's the difference. In the New Testament, Jesus said, you'll have my spirit with you. It's a supernatural love. It's not a love based on feeling or emotion. It's a love based on my agape strength and power and love. That's the love he's talking about. Proverbs 11, 2 says this, when you act with presumption, convinced that you're right, don't be surprised if you fall flat on your face. But humility leads to wisdom. This is the clearest way to define the new love. It's the simplest way to understand it. Colossians 3.12 says this, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I mean, that's a gamut to put all of your actions through. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a compliant a complaint, excuse me, against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities, add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. There it is. That's the filter, how you should approach situations. Start with humility, clothed in love. Second, learn to say no when it's best to say no. Some of us are horrible at this. We're afraid that saying no is unloving. It's unkind. No, it could be the greatest loving thing you do. There's a time to say no. It's a good word. Even Jesus had to say no. In Matthew chapter five, he made it very clear. Do not swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Amen to that. Just say yes or no. Anything else you say comes from the evil one. In other words, manipulative phrases, walking that line where you're not really being honest, just say yes or no. You know, we've all heard the phrase, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That is the most negative phrase. How about just tell the truth in love? If you had a hard time saying no, then you're a dream for telemarketers. You own like 18 toasters and 13 warranties for your car, right? You've got to learn to say no. Look at James 5, verse 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not use an oath when you make a promise. Do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Say only yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no, and then you will not come under God's judgment. You know, when I got into real estate back in the late 80s, uh, I met a guy who was super successful. He worked in my company. And uh, he said, listen, you got to learn how to say no to people if you're going to be a great salesman. I'm like, okay, what do I do? He said, oh, let me give you an example. Whenever somebody says something and it doesn't, you know, you want to say no to it, say this. You know, that doesn't work for me. I'm like, really? So I remember I was with these people in an open house and I'm like, hey, I'd like to show you some other houses. Would you like to do that? Sure. I said, well, if you could just sign this little contract giving me the exclusive right to represent you. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, can't you just show us? I said, mm, that doesn't work for me. You know why? Because inevitably in real estate, they go with someone else. I'm like, I'm not doing all the work so somebody else can get it. So I said, that doesn't work for me. Some of you need to learn that phrase right now. Hey, listen, that tone, it doesn't work for me. Those hateful words, they don't work for me. This temper tantrum, it doesn't work for me. You making me feel guilty all the time, it doesn't work for me. Learn to say no. Listen, if you're a parent, you better learn to say no. It could mean life or death for your child. Amen. Say, well, I, I raised four kids with my wife. We were not perfect. But I'm going to tell you, we sought grace and truth in everything we did. Today, all of our children love Jesus. They love their family. They want to be together. 
our grandchildren are well adjusted. Why? Because we sought grace and truth and we didn't hesitate to say no. There were times like no. And there were times we had to remind our children when we say no, don't pull away. Because the next time you pull away could be in front of traffic. Got to learn to say no, even when they're adults. Third, give consequences if necessary. Give consequences if necessary. That's biblical. Some of you are thinking, well, with, with an adult? Sure. Sometimes you've got to give consequences. Sometimes you've got to go beyond saying no to doing no. You've got to move to actions. Look at Proverbs 19:19. 19, 19. If someone has a hot temper, let him take the consequences. If you get him out of trouble once, you'll have to do it again and again and again. Hallelujah. Has anybody really ever been around a rageaholic? Uh, anger management person in your life, they will train you with their anger to do exactly what they want and you'll walk on eggshells for the rest of your life. That's right. The Bible says don't do it. Don't rescue that person. Let God deal with them. You know, the fact of the matter is, if there's a certain percentage of the human population out there that disregards your words, they disregard your vulnerability uh, when you say that hurts me, they disregard your warnings like this is going to go bad, they disregard your steps to health. They disregard anything you say. Even God had to give consequences. As a matter of fact, in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 6, through my servants, the prophets, I gave your ancestors commands and warnings, but they disregarded them and suffered the consequences. Then they repented and acknowledged that I, the Lord Almighty, had punished them as they deserved and as I had determined to do. Now they were under the law. And they refused to make God their only God. They wanted a man for a God. And he said, okay, here's your consequences. You know, the God of endless grace and mercy still allows us to suffer consequences to teach us. There may be a need for a necessary ending in a relationship. You want to know the hardest place to have a necessary ending in ministry? Staff in a church. Over the years, 35 now, I've had to let people go, and it's hard. You know why? Because when somebody comes into ministry, you've got two sides of groups of people coming at you. First, they come in. You want them to feel like family. They are family. You're part of the staff. You want them to feel loved. You want to build that relationship. shouldn't be boss and employee. It's you know, shepherd, but that's, here's what happens. Inevitably, they're not doing their job. They're abusing the ministry. They're abusing the finances. Hey, we have to answer to God for that. And eventually, after time and time again of giving that person opportunities, you have to say, it's not the job for you. It's okay. Still love you. And do you know what happens most of the time? Never see him again. One of the saddest things for me is to not have relationships with people because they didn't work out. You know what? It's a necessary ending. And sometimes you need a necessary ending in your life. You know, they're not perfect people. You're not perfect either. Right now in our world, we have a lot of 32-year-old, 3-year-olds. We have a lot of people that need necessary endings to grow up. And you know what's going to happen? If you don't help with that necessary ending, there's going to be more pain and suffering down the line. Amen. If you continue this behavior, here's how you do it. If you continue this behavior, I might have to leave the house. If you continue this behavior, I might have to hang up the phone. If you continue this behavior, I'm not going to talk to you. You have to practice love and humility, and there have to be consequences. And then finally, write this down and we'll close. Remember, the hope for restoring my relationships is always Jesus. Always Jesus. He's the only hope of restoration. Now, he has restored our relationship by dying for us on the cross. And by putting our faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection, we're saved. We're restored. But he also restores our relationships when we yield to him, when we repent and change our mind and surrender. Always remember that Jesus is the hope. Listen, do you want peace from God in your relationships? Of course you do. Then full restoration comes from being encouraging, Seeking people of the same mind as Christ and living in peace. And please stop lying to yourself and saying, you know what? I think if we date and I marry this person, I can really change him. 
2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Listen, I want to leave you with great hope today. Because I know we've dredged up some painful thoughts. There's hope. You can have a great relationship even with crazy makers. But they have responsibility. They got to carry their backpack you can help with burdens, but not the backpack. You know, boundaries are not about destroying things. They're about protecting your life. So some of you need to prayerfully look at this. Go home and take some steps. You're not on this planet to rescue people. Jesus does that. You're on this planet to have restoration and unity. And that only comes with people. We're surrendered to Christ. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. You know, the Bible says this, God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin by dying on the cross to be sin for us, taking all of our sins, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, if you're here, or you're watching, and you honestly cannot say, I know for sure if I die, I'll go to heaven, then you need to receive that grace. You need to talk to God silently in your mind and say something like this, God, I admit it. I can't do anything to save myself. I'm a sinner. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he paid for all of my sins. And I believe he rose again three days later. And right now, I trust in him alone to save me. Thank you, God. Welcome to the family of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have a home in heaven and a purpose for living, and I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward, but in just a moment, I'm going to have you slip your hand up and put it right back down. It just tells me you got it. So if you're saying, today, I believe, and I receive that free gift, will you just slip your hand up? Just slip it up. God bless you guys. God bless you. Many hands. God bless you. I see your hands back. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. Wow. Man, that's the gift of grace. You know, we have a gift for you. We have a new Bible and some other gifts. You can stop at the Connection Center on your way out. Just set like a new believer bag. They'll give it to you. I'll be out there. Or you can text the word believe to the church number, 720-895-9000, and we'll get it to you this week. Welcome to the family of God. And I want to pray for all of you in this room who are going, I need to have a talk. I need to make a decision. I need to be strong. I need to say no. I need to say there's some consequences. I'm going to pray for you. Father, thank you for these you've called into your kingdom today. You've rescued them from hell and from death. And Lord, they are your children forever. Thank you, Father. God, I pray that as they leave, they would just be filled with overwhelming joy. They'd mark this date down and celebrate. Lord, I pray they'd come back and be baptized following in obedience you Lord but Father I pray for my brothers and sisters here and watching that they would take these principles and that they'd apply them to their relationships that they'd make the decision to have the conversation to have the consequences uh, admonished and, and, and Lord maybe to even have a necessary ending give them strength we love you Jesus thank you for being our hope it's in your name we pray.